Coming up on Wild Talk, Kate Rundle brings us some crazy and quirky moments caught on camera. Joe Appel hosts an introduction to our new Wild Talk host, Steve Hamilton. And I, I, I wasn't grown up around hunting. I, I was kind of thrown into it back at that, that age when your grandparents could take you out of school with no problem. Ryan Kohler guest hosts talk with Jim Ruff, owner of Black Colt Lodge. Yeah, we have a short season. We open the 21st and we close down uh, basically the first period of September. And we do that because it is the prime fishing time for everything in that inlet, including what we're more interested in is Big Chinook. And Dustin Snyder, president of Spruce City Wildlife Association. There's some science and whatnot that has really changed the way things have happened. And uh, back in the early 2000s, all the hatcheries up here were shut down because the department and Spruce City were using coastal science. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gores. The Wild TV Canada app. And these fine sponsors. Hey everybody, welcome back to another segment of Wild Talk. I'm your host, Joe Appel. And today I'm excited to introduce a new member of the team here. We have Steve Hamilton joining us from Prince George. Steve, why don't you say hello? Hey, how's it going, everyone? Uh, pretty thrilled to be here. Steve, great to have you. You and I go back quite a few years now. Um, you're extremely involved in the outdoors with numerous different groups. Um, why don't you give us a brief intro into your background? What got you involved in the outdoors and what has made you so passionate about the outdoors? Well, you're uh, asking me to unbox quite a bit there. But yeah, as, as you said, we do go back quite a few years. So Got a good relationship we kind of built based on the mutual love of the outdoors and hunting. I'm in Prince George and I wasn't always here. Came up here about 17 years ago and came up from the, the lower mainland of Vancouver. And I, I I wasn't grown up around hunting. I I was kind of thrown into it back at that, that age when your grandparents could take you out of school with no problem. And that's kind of what happened. My grandfather and my great uncle showed up when I was about eight or nine years old and said, hey, you're coming with the guys for this weekend. And long story short, learned how to shoot, learned how to throw a knife, learned how to make my own campfire. And the bug was kind of there the whole time. And I, it kind of lost a little bit of me uh, through, through the years. So when I moved up to PG, I, I quickly found out that piece that was missing. Uh, it, it was it was the outdoors, and when I started to jump in with both feet after a, a wild game banquet up here, I I was all in. So I got my hunting license, I got my PAL, got my trapping license, and now I'm a passionate advocate for all that entails. And it's not about me; it's about future generations and preserving it for them. Absolutely, and you are doing a fantastic job of all of the above. We're going to get into that a little bit more after the next break. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that early interest in the outdoors and that bit of a gap and then you kind of get reintroduced to your love of the outdoors. It seems to be very common for a lot of people these days. You go through that stage where you're removed, but then somehow, if we're fortunate, we get reintroduced and we get that passion that comes back in later on. Um, moving up to Prince George, I think would make anybody fall in love with the outdoors. <laughs> the pictures and the videos of the wildlife you guys have up there and the stuff you send me throughout the year is absolutely amazing so stay tuned we got to go to a quick break but we'll be right back with a deep dive with new host steve hamilton and welcome back once again we are joined by new wild talk host steve hamilton Steve, just before the break, we kind of did a quick little intro to you. Um, and one of the things you mentioned was you fell in love with the outdoors again once you moved back or up to Prince George. Um, what was it? What were those primary triggers once you moved up to Prince George that really pulled you back to the outdoors? In, in a nutshell, I, I went to a game banquet that uh, a couple of friends of mine said, hey, let's go. We got a free ticket for you. It wasn't something that was on my radar. And... 
when I saw the passion and felt the passion that was in the room, I kind of felt that little piece of me that was missing that whole time that I didn't really know what it was. I got to try wild game in, in its true essence. I got to try moose and elk and cougar and all the stuff that y you kind of almost take for granted in the hunting community. And mm -hmm. I, I realized quickly that if I was going to be a part of that community and a, and a hunter that, that, uh, conservation requires a commitment and I, I jumped in with both feet as i mentioned before the break and it it was something that was just ingrained i it's a feeling and you as a hunter joe you you should probably be able to re relate to that quite easily and I, I i got outside and i was just taking drives and realizing that there was so much more to to life and and to British Columbia, then, then right in front of you, it was, it was a feeling and it's just tough to describe. It's very true, but it is a feeling, as you mentioned, shared by all of those who are fortunate enough to be involved in the outdoors. Uh, I was raised in a small town here in Squamish and the, the hunting community was such a tight core. Uh, I can remember the, you know, the skinning parties, the butcher parties, all of that stuff as a young kid, you know, when one of the dads brought something home and everybody would get together. That is such an important part, um, and I think throughout the years, it's somewhat kind of been diluted, but then there's certain groups um, that, that are really doing their best to hold true to that, um, and you mentioned you dove in, you know, both feet and just went straight at it, and I would say, based on the impact, I mean, all the different groups I've done work with here in British Columbia, every single time they're like okay let me introduce you to the team and i swear there's probably not one email thread that your email is not included on because <laughs> you are involved in so much so when you talk about the community aspect and building that community it's pretty special to see how how involved you've been um with with that being mentioned are there any specific causes that that are very near and dear to you it's probably difficult for someone such as yourself who's so tied to so many but are there any off the top of your head that really drive home with you right now oh absolutely uh like i said i went to that wild game banquet up here years ago and i i got a free membership to spruce city wildlife association and i i quickly realized sitting around that table that i was surrounded by a fellowship of people that just they cared they cared deeply and they cared passionately about preserving it so i ended up becoming a director then president for about six years and now we are the largest and most technologically advanced volunteer run hatchery in British Columbia. We've, we've got our hands in a bunch of different projects up here, mostly related to the endangered and threatened Chinook salmon that we all know as British Columbians. When, when you think of an iconic water species, it's the salmon that shows up. So that's one that's near and dear to my heart. Looking at my wall here, I got five or six life memberships to various sheep organizations across North America. And I've never even climbed a mountain to hunt a sheep. I'm intimately involved with the BC Wildlife Federation. Again, it's having my hands in so many different causes that actually make a real difference to giving back on the landscape. Unbelievable. And to think that this can all be tracked back to an invitation to a wild game dinner. Um, I mean, that just goes to show you how important it is. I mean, these groups are extremely important, but how important it is to continually invite people to experience the outdoors. Um, who knows, you know, where some of these causes and groups would be if you hadn't been invited out to that event and became so passionate about it. Obviously, you've had a pretty deep impact. So I think a very big underlying message there is to always focus on bringing new people into the fold because you never know who's going to have such a big impact, uh, clearly, as you have. And I have to say, on behalf of myself and the rest of the team here at Wild TV and Wild Talk, I'm extremely excited to have you come on board here. Um, as far back as I can go, I swear, every time I feel like I'm on the cutting edge of information, it's always because of messages from you. Like you have your fingers on the pulse in this province and across Canada. And I really truly think that our viewers are in for a big treat um, because you're gonna bring that same passion, that same informative approach to this show. Um, that is why I was such a big advocate for getting you on here. And uh, Steve, I'm so excited to have you on the team. Um, is there any final messages you would like to say before we hand the, hand the baton over and, uh, you start pulling the reins a little bit? No, no pressure. Hey, that's, uh, 
quite, quite, quite the intro you gave me there. But I, I appreciate all the support that you and the, the, the folks at Wild TV have given me and allowing me to take on this role. And as you said, I'm passionate. I'm going to be diving into some issues that I know our viewers are going to love and want to hear more about. And as you said, we need to continue pushing that on people that uh, their voice matters that getting in and giving back matters. And that's ultimately what it's all about. You do make a difference. Absolutely. Very well said, Steve. And uh, on behalf of everybody at Wild TV, welcome to the team. Thanks. Welcome back to Wild Talk. I'm Kate Rundle. And I'm Scott Sterling. Here to present our segment featuring bizarre moments captured while out in the wild. For this week's episode, we've hunted down a variety of crazy moments to show you in three, two, one. <laughs> Get him in the net. Oh, I am so sorry. hungry this is right in the corner of our yard I think it's stuck inside the goat fence bye baby dear Pointless to drive through here with no food, I know, but you are so oh, handsome. Hi. Yeah, you're so handsome. <laughs> go! Go! Go, bro! Go!
really want to hug you. <laughs> Just goes to show you never know what can happen while out in the wild. If you have any interesting moments caught on camera, please feel free to send them our way. You could end up on a future episode of Wild Talk. Just send them over to us at wildtalk at wildtv.ca or slide into our DMs. Until then, stay wild, friends. Hello everyone, I'm joining Wild Talk, a special uh, fishy Wild Talk this week with my friend Jim Ruff from Black Gold Lodge. I've been to the lodge before, I've taken my son and he caught a 40 pound salmon in some of the most beautiful water we've ever seen in our lives. Jim, what's going on at Black Gold Lodge this year? Well, you know, we're, we're just getting started. Uh, we uh, came down to Vancouver right now to my home in Port Coquitlam and we're yeah, gathering supplies and going back up with our staff on the 15th of uh, July. So you know, we have a short season. We open the 21st and we close down uh, basically the first period of September. And we do that because it is the prime fishing time for everything in that inlet, including what we're more interested in is Big Chinook and uh, Coho. That's the big one, Canes and Silvers. And, you know, that's... Uh, we don't want to be in a situation where it's, oh, you should have been here. It got good after you left. None of that stuff. We open for six weeks a year, and that's all. We want to be there for super prime time. We can't put fish in the ocean, but we can put customers in at the very best period of the season. So the, what drew me to, the, to Rivers Inlet, to be honest, is that when I did some homework on giant Chinook, you found out pretty quick that it is basically the best place on the planet right now to catch your potential biggest Chinook of your life. So the year before I went, there was actually, I think it was a 105 or 106 pound Chinook. What's the story behind that fish? That's correct. Uh, that was a, a fellow from Vancouver Island and um, I saw pictures of it. Um, tried to do a catch and release, which I'm not big on, but regardless, that's just my opinion. Um, the fish are bigger now. I don't know why. We've been there 35 years. And, you know, in the older days, 70 and a pounder was, was that's the, the big one, right? But that's changed. Like last year in one location but where the, the public go, Dawson's Landing, uh, where I keep the lodge during the winter, he, he recorded four over 80 last year. And so ever since that, that same year of 105 or 6 pounds, whatever it was, there were plenty of 70s and 80s as well, eh? So, and 90s. So, I don't know why. Um, it's really nothing to do with hatcheries that I see because uh, an 8-year-old fish, the new uh, hatchery program wasn't even functioning at that time. But they're bigger fish. Why they're, I don't, I don't know. It's just that they're there and good on us. Do you know the age of a, of a fish that's 70 pounds or 80 pounds or 90 pounds? Yeah, well, it, and you know, if you send in the, all the fins, the right uh, scales, they can figure that out. But <clears throat> primarily, they're probably somewhere between 8 and 10 years old. Wow, okay, yeah, that's something I didn't know. I know that when we were there, we saw some guys catching some, well, my son caught a 40-pound salmon. Yeah, it was great, is, yep. Which is an amazing, it was his first salmon ever, and I think he was 10 at the time. <laughs> and um, and we did see some guys catching and releasing 60 pound plus salmon. So yeah, yeah. as far as big fish go, I mean, you guys have monster fish. Now, what you do that's a little different that, that I've noticed is um, you allow people to come and guide themselves and um, bring their own food. So tell me how that works. Well, you know, we started out that way. Brian, we started out with uh, bring your own food. We're the only lodge that has a complete kitchen in every unit. And, uh, you know, then we had, I remember being at shows and different guys, older guys especially, well, I'm not cooking my own food. And at the time, um, there was another option 
for a dining room that we refurbished and all the, all the rest. So we went into that, and now it's probably, I guess, 60% of our business, right? Because we are less expensive than any other place. Um, you know, and guiding in Rivers Inlet, to me, I've always said is a money grab. There's no need. We give a clinic. We travel the waters. We talk to people. Uh, if they're having trouble catching fish, we can suggest them do something different. Uh, a lot of times they listen. A lot of times they don't. You know, fishermen, are, they do their own thing. And it's sometimes hard to get them to change. But, you know, it, our whole point is to have a good holiday. You know, we provide good equipment. And all we want to do is just, you know, have somebody have a, a good holiday. Right. Okay. And then travel in. Um, how does it work to get there? Well, you know, it's uh, it's a fly-in lodge. There's no question about that. Um, we have had uh, guys come in with a charter boat from Port Hardy, which is rare a couple of times since we've been there. But it's mostly through, uh, well, Pacific Coastal flies from Vancouver to Port Hardy. And then they changed the name to Wilderness Air for the seaplanes. Uh, you will get there, get on either a, a goose or a beaver. Um, the odd time of Cessna, they, they've only got one of those. But it's, it's usually the goose where we can get eight people on that. We collect the money for the trips. Now, if it's somebody coming in that uh, is not doing the all-inclusive, then we would, uh, they would pay us the money because we, the, all the money for these charters has to, has to be in like in January. Okay, we'll be right back with Jim Ruff from Black Gold Lodge right after this message. Okay, we're back. I am hanging out with Jim from Black Gold Lodge. I'm actually headed to Black Gold Lodge in about a week and a half with both my sons. It's going to be the vacation that we've been looking forward to for a long, long time. I love going to BC. BC is a wonderful place. And if you haven't salmon fished before for Coho and Big Chinook, this is a really cool spot because like Jim just explained, you can go there and you can bring your own groceries. You can guide yourself. They give a, a really good orientation and, um, you know, Jim's been doing this for a long, long time. Jim, how long do you think you're going to do this for? What's the plan? Well, you know, I never, <laughs> I never really had a plan at any point. It just evolved and uh, it, it's big, probably the largest, uh, one of the largest on the coast of this type of a floating lodge. And, you know, the, um, actually, I'm thinking now it's time to move on for us. I'm 75, my wife's 73, and neither one of us are in super great health. She's had issues this last uh, year. She had seven surgeries in one year. So it's not easy for us, and now we are looking at it's time to get out. So, yeah, we might hang around for a while to help new uh, owners or whatever. But this is just a... It's just time. I can't work till, you know, I'm not going to work till 80 and be dead. <laughs> well, you, you hear firsts on Wild Talk. This is a first that, we've, uh, that we're hearing that Black Gold Lodge is going to be for sale. I, I can say to the viewers right now that are watching that it is such an unbelievable place. Um, the fishing is so amazing. They've got everything so well organized where you have your boat organized, the baits ready to go, the, the fishing tackle and rods, it's all up to date um lots of boats there's you know as far as safety goes you've got you know everything you need in the boat plus your your you can communicate with everybody at the lodge via the radios so when you're guiding yourself you feel pretty comfortable i'm from alberta as most people know so i don't you know i'm not on the the salt water all the time but even in that area even when we got into the ocean i was pretty comfortable driving the boats and uh, it's a really good experience. And I think guys that, you know, when they think about going salmon fishing, they usually think they're going to be going with a guide. And the reality is when you go to Rivers Inlet and Black Gold Lodge, you, you just, you, you really don't. Like the water's big, yes, but you go to the areas that they've shown you. Tell us about the orientation and what that would be like for a, new, for a fisherman coming to Black Gold Lodge for the first time. Well, you know what? We do uh, an orientation in our little eagle's nest uh, area. And it's a map showing different things, you know, the different spots, spots to watch out for. So we do all that. 
Um, when we finish in there, we go out to the boats, and then we have a fish clinic on the boat showing exactly how to operate it. But before people go out, we have them put the motor into gear and out So and while they're tied up so we, we can see if there's any issues or not. And, uh, yeah, it's um, basically, as far as the lodge orientation, we just tell them, you know, what time to be in, where the different facilities are, the gift shop and the ice machines and that kind of stuff, you know. So bottom line is that uh, we try to really cover it. And then while people are on the water, they've all got radios. They're all keyed into our tackle shop. They need anything, we can run it out. And we do travel around to see, you know, if everything's okay, and, um, you know, somebody's catching fish in a certain area, well, you know, it, that's a tough one for us because I can't go up to somebody that's not getting some, Well, go over to, to John Henry there and fish by him. He's catching fish. So, <laughs> meanwhile, that's his secret spot. So, yeah, it's, it's a touch and feel sort of a thing. You know, we have to be able to know where everybody is. That's the key because, you know, if you, when you've got 20 or 30 boats on the water, I have to know where they are at all times, just to be safe. Sure, and, and one last question. When I catch my fish, I'm gonna uh, bring it home, right? So what, what, is, what can someone expect as far as that process goes? Well, you know what, uh, if, you're, if you're doing the, the standard package where you're cooking your own food, there's cleaning tables. I think there's like 20 feet of cleaning tables, all water, uh, nice nylon, nice and new, and all the bags and stuff there. Now, if you're in there on our uh, all-inclusive package you would give us the fish we would fillet them for you as you requested and we would then bag them and then have them vacuum packed in our uh, vacuum packed room box with their names on it and ready to go in our big flash freezer and then bringing it home on the plane is just simply put it in the box fly it home that's, or drive yeah it home that's it if, if there's people traveling let's say europe germany uh we have the special wrap it goes in the box, then we'll wrap them again to make sure they get home frozen. And all the hotels in the area of Vancouver Airport all have freezing facilities for, for just for this uh, lodges. Okay. Well, Jim, thanks for joining Wild Talk. Thanks for coming on. I, it's, a, it's good to see you. I'm going to see you in about a week and a half. But I got to wrap up this segment of, uh, of Wild Talk. So thanks for joining, and we'll see you again soon. And thanks for inviting me, and I'll look forward to seeing you, Ryan. Take care. Are you a fan of all things outdoors and can't get enough? Head over to wildtvplus.ca and embrace the wild. Wild TV Plus has it all, friends. From new show releases, Canadian originals, tips and tricks to up your game, and playlists specific to your favorite species, Wild TV Plus is ready to hook you up and keep you satisfied. What's the catch? There ain't no catch for what you're real in. What's the cost? We keep it real low so you can spend more time watching and less time apologizing to your spouse for yet another hunting expense. Wild TV Plus is only five bucks a month. We're talking less than your daily doubles at Timmy Ho's. It's only 40 bucks for the year, so nothing that's gonna break the bank. Watch 24 seven streams of all of your favorite game. Included on the app are a variety of species, such as whitetail. I'm starting my whitetail journey now. Some of the funnest days are now. When you're setting up stands, putting everything together. Elk. Oakstone Outfitters, Central California. What in the world are we doing here in California? We're hunting the tool elk, one of three elk species known to uh, North America. Checking one off the bucket list. Moose. The moose rut's about to kick in, and now we're gonna be chasing those at the same time. We go to Scott Sterling. He's in Northwest Territories, and he's hunting moose. It doesn't get any better than this. I just spotted a massive bull just across the river. Bear, and much more. Well, I'm back in one of my favorite spots on the planet. It's one of those big bear rut nights. Don't have a lot of free time on your hands? We've got you covered with a variety of short form content to choose from. 
looking to start a new skill or build on an existing one? Our tips and tricks section has got you covered. Experience new, heart-pounding content from mountaintops to ramp. I look back and to ramp in the skyline. We're at a new Yukon in search of doll sheep. We're so excited for what's in store. To prairie fields. Navigate with precision. Purchase Wild TV Plus and receive free access to Onyx Hunt Elite membership. Wild TV Plus has teamed up with Onyx Hunt. A wicked BOGO deal. Buy one, get one. Get the Wild TV Plus app for $39.99 and get the Onyx Hunt app for three months for free. If you haven't checked it out, it's amazing. I've marked my salmon spots, all my whitetail spots. You gotta get it, you gotta try it. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe today and scroll gnarly videos for days on Wild TV Plus. All right, and we're back with Wild Talk. So stoked for, for this segment we're going to be doing here. It's with a good friend of mine, Dustin Snyder. He's president of Spruce City Wildlife Association, a nonprofit doing a ton of amazing good things up here in Prince George. So before we dig into Spruce City too much, I want to let the viewers know about you, Dustin. So how's things? I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. Yeah, when we started kind of spitballing this, this segment and we were talking about salmon, I knew immediately who I wanted to bring <laughs> on because... There, there's, I don't think there's too many people that are more passionate or more knowledgeable on a volunteer basis than yourself. So let, let's dig in a little bit about you your, yourself. Who are you and where you come from? Uh, so, yeah, so my name is Dustin Snyder. I was born and raised in, in Burns Lake, uh, just up the road from Prince George, small town. Uh, raised hunting and fishing, camping, all that outdoors stuff. Um, after graduating high school, I moved to Vailmont and uh, took uh, college outdoor recreation and ecotourism. And um, since then, I've uh, kind of moved back to Prince George and got into the restaurant business, kind of stayed out of the tourism stuff, but always, you know, still hunting, fishing, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, that's uh, Spruce City and, and yourself have been a, a huge connection to that. And um, just realizing the need for some attention, especially in this area on fish and wildlife. Yeah, it, it, exactly that. And that's kind of where you and I, we, we met for the first time at a board meeting at Spruce City probably about 10 years ago. And we immediately hit it off and, and realized through that mutual love of the outdoors and fish, wildlife and habitat that the salmon right here in our own backyard and throughout the province, to be blunt, we're in some dire need of some help. And I'll, I'll never forget the conversation that you and I had at the, the board meeting there when we looked at those green doors and said, what's behind there? And the, the president at the time said, well, open it and find out. And when we did, long story short, we put in probably 40, 50, 60 hours even worth of volunteer time to get those troughs open and to, to get running. Let's talk a little bit about the hatchery beginnings for Spruce City, if, if you can dig into that just a little bit. So yeah, so Spruce City's been doing salmon work since the late 70s, actually even before the um, before the Department of Fisheries founded the Salmonid Enhancement Program. Um, a lot's changed since then. Um, there's some science and whatnot that has really changed the way things have happened. And uh, back in the early 2000s, all the hatcheries up here were shut down because the department and Spruce City were using coastal science um, and you can't use coastal science on northern fish. It just doesn't work the same. Um, new science and, uh, and some grant funding for Spruce City has been a, a huge, a huge deal. And Spruce City's really kind of um, pushed the envelope and, and kind of blazed the path for, for hatcheries up here. Um, there, there wasn't any hatchery work going on up here. And uh, we were told at the time when we tried to get that hatchery going that hatcheries wasn't something that was going to happen up here. Um, and now I think there's probably four, uh, four different pilot hatcheries up here that between the department, First Nations and Spruce City Wildlife that we're operating. Um, and some awesome grant funding for Spruce City has actually made us now the, uh, the, the most technologically advanced volunteer facility in the province. 
Um, we have monitored equipment that no one else has. We have um, chillers that no one else has. We have all kinds of good stuff um, that even some Department of Fisheries staff are jealous of in their hatcheries. Um, aside from that, that stuff is all necessary for us because we're also the only volunteer group in the province that is uh, permitted to work with threatened and endangered Chinook stocks. Yeah, it, it, exactly that. And we, I, I like to think of it when we open those those green doors, we kind of kicked them in. We ruffled some feathers, we rattled a few cages, and and we got stuff done. And as, as you said, now Spruce City is the largest technologically advanced volunteer-run hatchery in, in northern BC. And that, why is that so vitally important to have a facility like Spruce City where we're located? I think there's a couple of reasons there. One, um, for the obvious impact directly to the fish, right? So we're working in the upper Fraser. We're the only group right now that's working on the Chinook in the, in the very top ends of the upper Fraser. You know, where we're working, we're within 20 minutes of Mount Robson. Um, so those very high ends, those fish that travel the longest distance. Um, and that, you know, arguably face the most threat because they encounter the most issues on the way to the top of the watershed, right? Um, aside from that is community involvement and just getting the word out there. Uh, as you know, Steve, when we first started up, there's a lot of people that, you know, salmon up here has been long time forgotten. Uh, the fishing opportunity has been gone for over a decade. It's, uh, it's, it's just something that if people can't really take part in it, they don't really know that it even exists or they're not really paying attention to it. So although we're right at the confluence of the Nachaco and the Fraser and, you know, arguably thousands and thousands of salmon, uh, sorry, salmon swim by each year. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of, if people aren't, uh, you know, if it's not brought to the forefront, they, they forget about it. And I think you crushed it there with that. And I know personally, when you and I've done hatchery tours or community engagement, there's people that walk by and they go, there's salmon in here, there's fish in here. So a lot of that outreach you take part in is, is, is a lot of education of those that they, they just don't know. And that's, that's a vital part of, of what you've got going on up here in Prince George. So we're going to shoot this out to a commercial and we'll be back real shortly with more from Dustin Snyder from Spruce City Wildlife Association. Onyx Hunt, tools and features to up your game. Offline maps for use without cell service. GPS tracking for navigation and route logging. Waypoints and other custom map tools to make maps your own. 3D maps for better scouting and planning. Terrain X for understanding elevation patterns and more. Make this season count and subscribe to Wild TV Plus today and receive three months of Onyx free. And we're back with Dustin Snyder from Spruce City Wildlife Association in Prince George. Been having an amazing chat so far about wild salmon and why they're so vital. So I mentioned and you mentioned that Spruce City is a volunteer run hatchery. And for those that don't know, hatcheries can be, they can be uh, divisive when it comes to uh, some people's thought processes and the science behind it. But why are hatcheries important, especially in a volunteer run facility in a location like Prince George? So, yeah, so what, what we're doing is we're, we're, uh, um, we're kind of under the mandate of stock rebuilding or, or conservation. Um, some hatcheries and yeah, there definitely is sometimes a hot topic around hatcheries, um, mostly regarding genetic diversity. Um, so when you're taking all of these eggs and, and fish back to your facility and breeding them there, they do have a significantly higher chance of surviving as opposed to the ones in the wild. Um, just as an example, like wild survival from egg stage to fry stage, you're between five and 15%, depending on, on where. Um, and in the hatchery, we average getting between 90 and 95%. So from that genetic material, we're getting a lot more offspring. So one thing that we are doing in our facility is we're doing what's called matrix spawning. We're actually taking one female and breeding, uh, splitting those eggs up into as many as five or six batches and breeding that single female with as many as five or six different males um, so that we're getting just kind of a different genetic mix and putting out a, a larger uh, diverse population. Um, and that's important too for, for the stock rebuilding because if the female or male that you do select do have any sort of disease issues or anything, 
um, again, you can be breeding that disease and putting it out. So breaking those up into smaller kind of genetic pools, if you want to call them that, is is really important. Right. And that, that breaks it down for, for somebody who's sitting on the outside that doesn't really know the value a little bit easier. So why particularly in Prince George are, are you targeting salmon and what species is it? So we're dealing with Chinook. Uh, some people call them king. I think there's a wide variety of names, springs, that sort of thing. Um, so we're focusing on Chinook mostly because uh, there's really only two main populations up here of salmon. That would be sockeye and Chinook. Um, sockeye can be higher, uh, more prevalent to disease and that sort of thing. So it's something that usually is, is done via spawning channels. There are a couple hatcheries doing it, but they do have different protocols. Um, the Chinook populations uh, in the Upper Fraser and in the Nechaco have been kind of decimated over the years. And, uh, and again, too, when we first started up, we're the only ones really paying attention to it and, and being vocal about it. So um, again, that, that education, not only to the public, but to government agencies as well, making sure that the government agencies know that somebody's paying attention, whether it was the management of the species or the management of the habitat, um, that somebody else out there was was paying attention to ensure things were being kept in check. Right. So, so what do you feel the main drivers of the the, the threatened and uh, endangered species in this local area are? What are the main what are the main threats? I guess we'd call it. That's a tough one. Um, it's uh, I, I wouldn't say that there's any kind of you know top five. It's kind of death by a thousand cuts. Um, we can make it better by by putting you know by healing some of those wounds over the years. Um, but I don't think there's necessarily any one or two things that, that are, are going to fix it. You know, over harvesting in the past was an issue. Um, habitat has been an issue. You know, we've all seen the floods and the fires that's affecting the watersheds. Um, you know, uh, climate change, water temperature, all this stuff. Big Bar was another one. Big Bar knocked out a whole bunch of fish um, for a couple of years. Passage was really terrible. Uh, the Big Bar landslide, for those of you that don't, don't know, um, stopped, you know, thousands of fish for a couple of years, really slowed them down. And, and, you know, when fish hit the river, they only have so much fuel in the tank. So um, they don't eat. And uh, if they run a gas part way, that's it. And they just don't spawn. Yeah, I, I remember Big Bar quite well. And Spruce City actually had a, a, a seat on the, uh, the committee, we'll call it, to provide input. We were the only volunteers that did, which was which pretty awesome. It shows the the footprint we've made in such a short time in, in the rebuild. But when, when you think of fish in BC, you think salmon. So in, in a minute or less, why are they so important to enhance and to protect? So, yeah, so I think, I think the best one that I can, I can use as an example is kind of just the term keystone species. And that's something that I've used every now and then. And honestly, just only about six months ago, did I actually look up the definition of it to see what it actually meant? Because I throw the term around, but I didn't have a clue. But a keystone species is essentially something that if you removed it from the ecosystem, it would greatly impact everything else around it. Um, salmon are exactly that thing. Salmon is something that everybody wants a piece of the pie. It doesn't matter if it's bears, eagles, people, um, you know, the, the carcasses that rot on the beach after spawning, that's important for bugs and the bugs feed the birds and some birds eat the carcasses. Um, those nutrients that the fish bring back all the way to the upper end of the watershed from the ocean, you know, they've been feeding on stuff that isn't up here. And there's all kinds of, you know, different vitamins and nutrients in those carcasses that end up in our forests up here. Um, that have a great impact. Um, and without those species up here, you know, our forests, even just the way the trees are growing and that sort of thing could look very different. I completely agree. And going back a few years, when we first started doing the brood capture here, that was one of the most magical experiences of my life, being able to just know that I was helping something continue its life and, uh, and pre preserve its genetic diversity. So, Dustin, I'd really like to thank you for your time. And I, I feel this is a conversation we could probably do again in the near future if you're up for it. For sure. Yeah. Always, uh, always happy to come back. And thanks for having me again. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time on Wild Talk. Wild Talk is brought to you by Trapper Gourds. The Wild TV Canada app. And these fine sponsors.